Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry, the three musketeers together again after so long, so many weeks of holidays and time off and rest and relaxation back at it again. (laughs) Yes. Which, which makes this stuff you should know. That's right. Hard, know? hard to come back for you? No, no. I think it was just long enough and everything was just satisfying enough that I, I'm ready. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. You're, How about you? You're one of those weirdos. It's like, <laughs> oh, I need to work. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> or like, my skin falls off. I've always said I would be a great lottery winner. Oh, yeah? Or a retiree? Yeah, lottery winner's better. I guess it's it's, a, it's the same thing. It's a retiree that doesn't have to sweat it. Right, exactly. Which is nice, man. Uh, nope. I just should tell people that we were discussing with Jerry um, the word dulcet as far as your voice. <clears throat> yes. Dulcet tones. He didn't know the definition. I looked it up. Oh, 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 yes. Uh, it said sweet and soothing, but mm-hmm. then in parentheses it says often used ironically. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. It's a backhanded compliment, I guess. Jerry, were you using it ironically? She actually, she didn't even nod. She's just sort of moving her face around. <laughs> <laughs> her skin falls off too when she doesn't work. That's weird. People uh, are weird. So sweet and uh, nougaty is what you said. No, that's uh, uh, almond joys. Oh, that's right. No, actually, no, Mars uh, bars. Mars bars. Uh, almond joys, coconut. Sweet and soothing. Okay, I'll I'll take that. Yeah, I still prefer Muppety Tenor. It's the greatest of all time. It's very eye-opening for me. <laughs> what was, oh, that was in an article about us. Uh-huh. Muppety Tenor. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. So, Chuck. Yes. I know that you, um, you're you a health-conscious dude. Yeah. At the very least, you're conscious of healthiness. Yeah, exactly. Right? I am, too. And for a very long time, I made the switch. And um, one of the things that I learned was... The, one of the easiest ways you can lose weight very quickly is to just cut, like, sodas out of your diet. Yeah, see, my problem is I don't even drink sodas. Right, so there's, like, a there's a whole step right there yeah. that, that's removed from you. It's fine. It's, I mean, I that's think, good, but in a way. Right, but, I mean, there's just no low-hanging fruit, as it were. Right. As far as using corporate buzz speak goes. Unless you count gallons of booze. <laughs> That's not low hanging, my friend. That's top of the tree. That's last. Top shelf. So um when you stop drinking soda, you you really do like the pounds just fall off. It's insane. I but bet. you still want soda, right? I mm-hmm. mean you, it's like the craving's still there. And the um soda industry knew this and they said, Hey, we don't want to lose a bunch of revenue. Let's start making diet sodas. Right. And apparently originally they uh made them Almost exclusively for people with diabetes um, it, around the post-World War II era. Yeah. You could find diet sodas with uh, basically an inscription or something like that. Like it was inscribed on every can. It would say something like, for people who must uh, watch their sugar allotment or something like that, right? Yeah. And then as the soda industry was like, oh, wait, wait, we can really like – make weight loss an issue here and like help promote weight loss Mm -hmm. by saying for people who wish to watch their sugar intake. Right. Right. And just that little tiny switch changed everything. And like the diet soda industry was born. So people passive aggressive nudge in the right direction. (laughs) Pretty much like, Hey, don't you think you should be watching your sugar (laughs) intake chubs? Yeah. You know, that's what's, that's what's between the lines. So we've got these awesome, diet sodas that are sweetened with artificial sweeteners. But of course, there's nothing can possibly just be just good or just great because there's apparently we're starting to learn huge, massive problems with artificial sweeteners as well. Problems so much that um, they they may be worse than than sugar, it turns out, in a lot of cases. Yeah. I mean, when have we found and replaced something natural with something synthetic? And have it be nothing but like a win-win. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's something, but it seems like there's always some kind of downside. I guess maybe like a robotic arm. 
Which is better than a real arm? It well, depends on the arm <laughs> that it replaces. It could be. So you're saving up for your robotic arm transplant? Sure. All right. I'm tired of being weak on my right side. So you can crush those uh, Coke Zero cans. <laughs> exactly. With more vigor. Oh, well, I'm not drinking anything any longer. After researching this, I'm like, yep, I'm done with diet soda altogether. Oh, whoa. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like like through. Not a, this isn't a phase or anything like that. I'm sure over the course of my life, I will have like yeah, yeah. A, a giant like Coke Zero at a movie or something like that. But I'm, I'm generally just totally done with well, diet soda. Well, what are you going to constantly be drinking then? Well, to be honest, I'd already kind of started. I was drinking um, like mineral water a lot more. Okay. And I found like once you just kind of switch over... The water, which used to just be disgusting, is actually kind of refreshing. <laughs> like just regular old, like like filtered water yeah, with ice. That's so funny because you know my history has always been heavy on the water. Sure, I know. Like you're uh, totally ahead of the game. It turns out. Well, by accident, but I just I've always loved the water. That's just how your taste has always run. Well, and that's, I was just raised on it. You know, I've said it before. Like milk and water, mm-hmm. we just didn't have a lot of sodas in the house, and it just never really grabbed hold of me in that way, you know? Right. But well, mixing milk and water. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it is. Well, then, then you have fat-free milk. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. At least thin milk. No, drink whole milk. I'm all about it. So I'm off of the uh, the diet sodas forever. Wow. Well, that's good for you. It is good, but if I want to brush my teeth or use mouthwash... You use diet or soda. Takes <laughs> ...or take certain vitamins or something like that... Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm still running the risk of encountering artificial sweeteners because they're everywhere now. Yeah. Well, let's uh, back up a bit then. That was a nice old school intro, by the way. Thank you. That's what you get after you take a nice Christmas break. (laughs) You've been rehearsing that one? For weeks. Yeah. (laughs) You woke up Christmas morning and Yumi was just like, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, no, I got to practice. Um. All right, well, we're talking about artificial sweeteners, but what we're really talking about at its essence is sweet, the the sensation of sweetness. Yeah. Um, and if you go back and listen to our, I think, pretty good episode on taste from many years ago, mm-hmm. uh, we break it down pretty well as far as the, the receptors on our tongue, so we don't really need to rehash that. But did you, did you go back and listen to it? Does it really hold up? Yeah, it's not bad okay. for an nice. older one. Um. I mean, we get to the point, there's not as much shenanigans, so a lot, oh, oh, yeah. a lot of people prefer those. <laughs> yeah, we've added a lot of filler over the years. That's okay. Um, but the the level of sweetness that we taste, it's going to depend, you know, those there are those receptors on our tongue, and they interact with those molecules, and they have to fit, you know, the shape has to fit. It's that weird thing that nobody really knows is going on on their tongue, that strange interaction is happening. Yeah, I remember from the taste episode, like one of the theories is that it's the the whole thing is happening on the quantum level. Wow, see. If I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, so how much sweetness you're going to taste, it, the level of sweet is going to depend on your own receptors and how they're binding to that sweet sensation. So these artificial sweeteners, what they do is they found a way to elicit that same response as as we get from sugar. Right. And basically that that's it. Some of them are uh, I mean obviously they're a, generally a lower calorie version of sugar, although we'll get to some that aren't later. Uh and the reasons for that is some of them they're all different, but some of them are so sweet, like hundreds and even thousands of times sweeter than sugar that they just need to use tiny tiny bits of it so it's basically no calorie. Other times we don't even synthesize and absorb it, and metabolize it, so that makes it no calorie. Yeah, you get the taste, but then it just comes out of your pee or your poop. Yeah. Yeah, but so no calories. Exactly. I I thought that was pretty interesting because I never really stopped and thought about why those things are no or low calories. Yeah, me neither. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Like uh, the idea that something is so sweet, you need to use so little of it that you subvert the calorie uh, system, the calorie system. It's like you can't even count that low. Yeah. That many decimal places beneath one calorie. And the weird thing is, to me, is when you look at the histories of some of these artificial sweeteners, um, and it's a little scary, is that a lot of them were discovered by accident from these dumb scientists 
who are like trying to <laughs> trying to discover something else or work on something else. Yep. And they're like, oh, well, let me lick my finger and get a piece of paper, or let me smoke a cigarette and not wash my hands. And they're like, oh, my hand tastes sweet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it really it drives home two things that chemists aren't really fixed on their um, their survival. They have low survival <laughs> skills. Yeah. And then two, that um, all these artificial sweeteners are, in most cases, extraordinarily, they're synthetic compounds, you yeah. know? Like um, saccharin was, or is, a derivative of coal tar that was accidentally discovered when they were trying to find a new dye. Yeah. And then uh, I believe um, aspartame was a non-starter ulcer drug. Yeah, and the dude was literally picking up paper and, like, licked his finger mm-hmm. and said, oh, well, that's, isn't that how LSD that was an accident, too. It was. It was. Are no scientists washing their hands anymore? No, apparently not. At least not the, the chemists. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess so. Chemistry. I don't want to throw all of science under the uh, steam No, roller. <laughs> it's just the chemists who don't care whether they live or die. Uh, so anyway, saccharin, which is one of the first, or I guess the first, artificial sweetener way back in 19, um, 1879. Yeah, way back in 1979. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in 1879, that that was a uh, scientist who did not wash his hands before dinner, mm-hmm. and noticed it tasted sweet, and said, "I think I have a new discovery on my hands." Yeah, literally on my hands. Yeah, <laughs> and on my tongue. Uh-huh. And boy, oh boy, is it sweet. Yeah, and it's funny to think of that. Yeah, there's a lot of chemicals and compounds out there that we may have no clue actually taste sweet because it, it, we just haven't accidentally run across them yet. Like because everyone's washing their hands now. Yeah, and plus also, sugar has just such great PR that you tend to think that it has the market cornered on the sweet sensation. But no, it's it's just one of many things that yeah. elicit that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the reason, well, there's a lot of artificial sweeteners. We're only going to go over a handful in detail. But the reason there are, I mean, there are a couple of reasons. One is just good old-fashioned competition, of course. Uh, and another is you can't use them all in the same way, like some... Hold up under baking. Some don't. Uh, some you can just dust in a throat lozenge, and another might be good in a cake batter. You know. Mm-hmm. So it kind of depends on its use. As to some are good in ice cream, and others aren't. Yeah, but you you hit it on the head though too. I mean, like there is a lot of competition. Like aspartame is owned by Monsanto now, and like anytime those guys get in on something, there's that means it's automatically big business. So there's a lot, a lot of money to be made. And one of the reasons why also that it is such big business because it, it's very frequently much cheaper to produce this stuff, these artificial sweeteners, than it is to to um, process sugar. Right. So right. say it takes like eight cents worth of sugar to sweeten uh, a two liter of Coke. It might take three um, cents worth of aspartame to sweeten Coke Zero. Right. And if you're making, you know, millions upon millions of two liters of this stuff a year, that adds up pretty quick. Yeah. And in fact, there was actually a British company. I didn't see which one it was, but they it was found that their orange drink which was not being marketed as diet or sugar-free or anything, was basically um, made up of artificial sweeteners, Who not sugars. This? I didn't look it up. Oh, oh. I just ran across it somewhere. It was an orange, orange like soda in Great Britain. Oh, in Great Britain. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll call, it, good. call it shame aid. <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because, you know, my one weakness is like once a month I'll get the old fan of orange. Yeah, the Nazi drink. Oh, so I'm okay with that. Just <laughs> <laughs> Shaming me. Yeah. Uh, well, so these things are pretty controversial. Um, since literally since the first ones came around, um, people started like with anything that's new and synthetic. Uh, there are going to be a certain segment of people who are like this is great, and another segment they're like, well, I don't know about this. Let's look and see what's going on in your body, and what if it's not so good for you, and how do we know? <laughs> right. People concerned with health. Yeah, that's an easier way to say it. And public health. Yeah. Yeah, yeah There's. Um, it does kind of seem to be like, Chuck, we're at this point in history where there is a lot of this stuff out there. I think I saw a 2016 article that said there's like 3,500 products in the U.S. using one, at least one of the five approved artificial sweeteners by the FDA. Wow. 
So there's tons of products out there and not enough medical literature to sh to really strongly show one way or the other that, yeah, these things actually are pretty safe and like all of these fears are just a general public distrust of science and change and unnaturalness. And we don't also have anything to show the other way, too, that, um, no, actually, these things are pretty unsafe. Because it seems like every study that you find has a contradictory study with just completely opposite findings. Yeah, it's pretty frustrating. And, yeah, and they're, like ev they're, they're canceling each other out. It is frustrating. It does seem, though, that the at least based on the, the reporting that I'm seeing or have seen in research, it, it seems like a body of... Um, Medical literature is mounting that's showing that the, the this stuff is pretty problematic, actually. Yeah, I mean, if you just uh, throw science out the window and start perusing the Internet, which everyone should do, right? Mm -hmm. At <laughs> least know, once a day. If you go on websites, though, and, and Internet forums and look around, um, people will blame, I mean, just about any disease you can think of on – Aspartame is a big one that's getting a lot of the heat, but all mm -hmm. kinds of artificial sweeteners, um, MS, brain tumors, uh, dizziness, uh, Alzheimer's, like all kinds of problems. People are saying, well, you know, this didn't start happening until I started eating or drinking this, which contained this. Right. Yeah. It's anecdotal. Extremely anecdotal. And like you said, when you look at the real studies, and we're going to get to some of these, and of course some... Are, are mounted by the, the very company selling them. And I had a, a thing on Facebook last week about these company-backed studies and whether or not we should even listen to them. And most people chimed in that were in, in the biz and said, you know what, it doesn't mean it's junk science. Um, a lot of these studies wouldn't even be done if it wasn't for these companies funding them. But I still, like, raise an eyebrow anytime I see, like, Nope, uh, Coca-Cola debunks study that says it's bad for you <laughs> right. with their own study, you know? <laughs> right. Like, how can you... I'm not even a big cynic, and you just have to sort of wonder if that's complete BS or not. Yeah. Well, the FDA, for its part, if you go to their website uh, on their Q&A, as far as them defending their the things that they've approved, <laughs> they kind of... Well, I'll just read it. It says, uh, <laughs> all, all consumer complaints related to the sweetener have been investigated as thoroughly as possible by uh, federal authorities for more than five years, in part under FDA's uh, ARMS system, or ARMS system, Adverse Reaction Monitoring System. In addition, scientific, and that's where people can submit their own beefs, basically, right? Yeah. And say, like, hey, I'm dizzy, I just drank a tab. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in addition, scientific studies conducted during aspartame's pre-approval phase uh, failed to show that it causes any adverse reaction in adults or children, Individuals who have concerns about possible adverse reactions to aspartame or other substances should contact their physician. Basically, hey, if you're not feeling good, maybe it's on you. Yeah, why don't you stop being so <laughs> metabolically weird? Go to your weirdo. doctor. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and since you brought up the FDA, there's a lot of concerns about how just how much oversight they're bringing to the table. Yeah. Um, and from the, uh, there was this Washington Post article I found. It yeah, sounds I read like, that too, man. Like not much at all. There's this um, separate track. It's basically like an expedited track that a company who's looking for FDA approval for their food item can submit. Yeah. And rather than – so ideally there's this FDA review process where the FDA says – let us see your studies. We're going to do some research. We might do some testing ourselves. It's going to take forever. You're going to lose a bunch of money while you're sitting there waiting to go to market. But we will know pretty pretty conclusively that it's safe for humans to use. Yeah. Although even, even that's not necessarily true. But that's like the ideal situation that will get maybe close to, yes, this is safe for humans. Well, they've basically done away with that and created this fast track program where you can submit for generally regarded as safe status. Yeah, that was 1997 is when everything kind of, there was a big sea change there. Yeah, and they did it because business was like, guys, you are taking so long. This is so slow. This process is killing us. It's costing us so much cash. We want to go to market faster. Well, and the FDA and, was like, we don't have enough people. Right. What do we do? 
So instead of hiring more people, they just made it easier for the companies to get this stuff passed. And the way that they did that was the FDA said, how about this? You guys go study the medical literature, write a review of what you find, and we'll read your review. Yeah, and no, then we'll give you yeah. approval. So don't you don't need to submit your data anymore. Just give us your your findings, your findings, and a summary, and that should speed things up. And it right. did in a big, big way. And it, it proved the FDA was so toothless that apparently now a lot of companies are releasing food additives into the food supply without even talking to the FDA about it. It said in this article that the um, the one of the deputy commissioners for food at the FDA. He said, we simply do not have the information to vouch for the safety of many of these chemicals. The FDA is just like, oh, well, there's a new food additive out there. I hope it goes, I hope it goes well for everybody. Yeah, and, and the, I don't know if in the FDA's defense, or, but what they said initially was the reason we did this is we thought that people were doing this anyway and just introducing new chemicals without a, like submitting for approval at all. Right. He said, so maybe if we streamline this process, they'll at least do that. And that just hasn't worked out how they hoped basically. No. Nope. It's like um Citizens United ruling. Oh yeah. You know? All right, well let's take a break. I need to go I'm I'm angry now. Sorry. <laughs> I need to go smash. <laughs> we'll be back right after this. Chuck, postage rates have gone up again, Ugh. which means trips to the post office, which already stink, are even worse now. It's going to be so crowded with people shouting and saying, look at these prices. Thanks to Stamps.com, however, you don't have to worry about it. That's right. Just use Stamps.com to automatically calculate and print and print the correct amount of postage for every letter or package you send. They're going to bring all the services of the U.S. Postal Service Right to your fingertips because you can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and your own printer. Yeah, and Stamps.com makes it easy. They'll send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage, and they'll even help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. Plus, Stamps.com saves you money. How important is that? Super. That's right. They're going to give you postage discounts that you can't get at the post office, including three cents off Every first class stamp. Yeah, and right now you can use our offer code STUFF and get a four week trial that includes postage and a digital scale. So don't wait. Go to stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage. Type in S T U F F. That's stamps.com. Enter STUFF and sign up today. With stamps.com, you'll never have to go to the post office again. <laughs> Okay, we're back. Chuck, you feeling better? Whew. Yeah. That Ming vase, man, that was like an original. Yeah, well. That was real. It's a goner now. That's going to come out of Jerry's pay. Unless you get some super glue. Uh, oh, yeah, like that that Brady Bunch episode. Yeah. Mom always said, don't play ball in the house. Oh, did they break something? Yeah, they broke a vase playing basketball uh, in the house, oh, and yeah. um, they tried to glue it back together, and then Mrs. Brady used it for some flowers, and oh, it sprung right. a bunch of leaks. That's so dumb. I love those What kids. are you doing playing basketball inside anyway? That's dumb. Just, you know, horseplay, roughhousing, the use. I mean, their outside was a, a studio set with AstroTurf. Like, it's always <laughs> it's always perfect weather. <laughs> yeah, and that one little quarter driveway. Uh-huh. Yep. I bet it would be so disappointing if you could go see a recreation of that set today. You know? Uh, Yeah. It's like I sat at the uh, Cheers bar once, the real, mm. the, the not the one in Boston, but the where they shot the TV show. Oh, okay. And it's just everything is just always smaller, you know. And that including, was a big set, uh, including Rhea Perlman. <laughs> she was tiny. <laughs> she was like in my beer mug. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the one in Boston. It's like nothing like the set. So I thought that's where you were going. I didn't realize you'd been on the actual set. Yeah, that's when I did my famous uh, extra stint on Dear John. And Cheers uh, was uh, next door. I okay. I don't know this story. Yeah, yeah. When my brother he worked on Dear John, and I went out to visit him and. He got me on as an extra. I played a busboy in a restaurant scene. Did you really? Yeah, I'd love to get a copy of that, actually, and post it. Yeah, I want to see that. It was pretty good. 
Yeah. That was my first encounter, like real encounter with the film business. And I was like, this is a weird thing to do. This is the life for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to play bus boys all my life. And one day I'm going to have a short lived t- failure of a TV show myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, all right. So where were we? Uh, we were talking about a TV show. Oh, no, no, no. We were talking uh, about coming back from the break. And I wanted to mention, you said earlier that uh, when we first intro that sometimes this stuff like does more harm. And this, this one Purdue University study <clears throat> I thought was really interesting because it found that drinking sugar or eating and drinking uh, sugar-free stuff with uh, diet drinks mainly uh, can actually mess with your body's ability to naturally count calories because it, it just messes up what the body recognizes as real sweet and real calories. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, can make but, that, which can make you fatter, right? Yeah, apparently there's been a number of studies, including like really, really good longitudinal longitudinal studies, like the San Antonio Heart Study, that have found that um, sh- like high levels of diet soda intake are correlated with obesity. Yeah, meaning everything else equal, the person who drinks more diet soda is likelier to be obese, which makes zero sense. It's it's pretty confounding, right? The whole reason or one of the big reasons people drink diet soda is so they can lose weight. But it turns out that they're actually more likely to be obese. And I should say compared to people who don't drink diet, diet soda, right. not compared to people who drink non-diet soda. Right. That's not to say, like, yeah, a, a Diet Coke drinker is more likely to be obese than a Coke drinker. It's a Diet Coke drinker is more likely to be obese than somebody who just drinks water. Right. And this per- Purdue study really, like, gives some insight to that. Basically, we, our body tells us how many calories we need to take in, and part of that is based on how sweet something is. So once we start drinking and ingesting these artificial sweeteners, it just it goofs everything up. It it basically says that our body doesn't associate sweetness with higher calories anymore. Yeah, right. Because with with something like uh, artificial sweetened soda, right? When you when you eat food, your body has a couple of pathways that it rewards you for saying, "Hey, good job. Eat, you ate food. Yeah. I'm going to make it so that you want to eat food again." And one is the gustatory pathway or gustatory component, which is like the taste, the the smell, the the sensation that you get from eating like good food or a, like something sweet and delicious. And that just activates your limbic system like crazy. Your reward pathway goes nuts, right? Yeah. But when you eat stuff, you also have the second component, which is um, where you're satiated, the feeling that you get, that great pleasant feeling of being like nice and pleasantly full from eating, right? Yeah. And that counters that gustatory excitement. So normally when you eat food, you you get the excitement from the, the taste of it. And then ultimately you'll also get the nice pleasant feeling from being full from it. Not so with an artificial sweetened soda. Instead, you get the excitement. Your sugar rush is going off, but you're never going to get full. And since we're nothing but junkies as far as like our brains are wired, we're just going to keep drinking more and more and more because that sugar center is going off and we're never getting full. So it's never counteracted. We just always crave more and more and more. Yeah. And of course, like you said, these studies, there's always an opposite one that it was uh, debunked as flawed um, by the National Soft Drink Association. Yeah. So they, they didn't even it. try. They just said wrong. <laughs> but that's not, that Purdue study is not the only study. There have been plenty of other studies that have looked into this and have found the same thing that, that, there's, there's, that our bodies are being tricked, that we're no longer yeah. associating sweet foods with high calorie foods and that it's leading to eating more high calorie food so that if you eat something that actually is sweet and has calories you're going to eat more of it than you would have before because your brain's not used to saying uh i've got enough calories from this i can stop eating it now right playing tricks on your body yeah, and plus also apparently with these these things that are 300, 500, 7,000 times sweeter than sugar, which is what our body is used to is, is some form of sugar, um, the, the, the sensation of sweetness is amplified. And so it kind of mutes sweetness in other things like fruit 
or any any other complex tastes like in vegetables. So we end up just craving more and more sweet stuff because everything else tastes terrible compared to this ultra sweet stuff that we're we're eating and drinking. And if you stop drinking like like soda or diet soda or whatever, or stop eating junk food for even just like a week or so, yeah. when you go back to it, it's amazing how sweet that stuff actually is. Oh, I bet. It's it's like a smack in the face. Yeah. But you realize like, wow, I've really been used to this for a while because I don't remember it tasting this sweet. Yeah, and my headaches are, are now gone because I'm drinking <laughs> this again. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, and the other thing too, and I know we covered a little bit of this in the high fructose corn syrup, but part of the problem is is the ubiquity of this stuff. It's, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, which one was it? Was it aspartame that's in... Yeah, aspartame is in 6,000, more than 6,000 products. Yeah. Like soft, you know, soft drinks, of course, gum, uh, puddings, dessert mixes, gelatin, frozen desserts, fillings, yogurts. Uh, and, that, and you know, of course, people just dump it right into their coffee, too. Sure. Uh, in its purest form. But um, you, unless you're really a stickler about looking at food labels, you're getting way, way more than the maximum recommended levels that you should be ingesting of this stuff because it might be, like I said, in the I got a sore throat, so I took the cough drop, and now I'm chewing gum. Now I'm using toothpaste, and it's all over the place. Right, exactly. And that's another part of the problem where even if the FDA is doing its job and does all this research and re looks at the medical literature, um, they may say, okay, this stuff is safe. At this level, this is the maximum recommended amount that a person should have and still be within the safe zone per day. Yeah. So don't put more than this in your soda. Okay, great. Go forth and prosper. And then that soda becomes a success and other people start using that sweetener. And then it's like you said, like with aspartame, it's everywhere so that the people are getting that amount just from that, that, that soda with aspartame that they're drinking. But they're also getting it from all these other places and the levels rise very quickly. Yeah, and some folks get, I mean, there's a definite um, soft drink addiction problem, um, even with the diet sodas. I've, I've known people who literally drank, like, a couple of two liters a day of this stuff. Sure, yeah. Like, just constantly drinking soda all day long from the moment they get up till the moment they go to bed. Right. Yeah, but it's the, diet, so it's no big deal. Exactly. And um, there was actually a study that I came across. Um, I didn't see where the study was from, but this was, it was mentioned on this um, Harvard Health blog. Um, they, it, it was a rat study where rats were given the choice between oral saccharin and intravenous cocaine um, after they'd been acclimated to both, and they <laughs> tended to choose the saccharin. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, slightly. Did they go round and round? <laughs> they did. Sorry. They're, they're probably like, I've heard about that cocaine. I'm not doing that, but I will do the saccharin. By the way, there's a uh, uh, an audio interview on YouTube with the drummer from the band Rat mm -hmm. that's like an hour and 20 minutes long that you should, I mean, try and get through 15 or 20 minutes of it. But the way I saw it is someone said, uh, this is the Donald Trump of, of 80s hair metal. <laughs> Was it a contemporary, like today? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He basically okay. has a new group that does rat songs, and I think it's, he's just the drummer that's the original member, and mm -hmm. and just goes off for like an hour and a half about how great they are and about how that's the real <laughs> stuff and how they sound better than the original rat ever sounded. And, and, <laughs> and it's really something. Like, I've never heard someone who was more full of themselves than this dude. Wow. It was hysterical. It was really wonderful. Well, what, how many songs could they possibly play? Did they just play round and round like like 12 or 13 times at a show? Yeah, they had a few hits. All I remember is round and round. No, they also, uh, well, I'll, I'll think on it. <laughs> they I'll were not a one-hit wonder, though. I'll bet you're thinking of Cinderella or Dokken. No. I think Dokken had more hits than Rat. No, they had... Uh, lay it down. Remember that one? No. Can you sing it? Sure, you do. Lay it no. down right now. <laughs> oh, oh, that's. And all. then they had Wanted Man. <laughs> no, nope, that's I'm Bon Jovi. Man, no. And then You're in Love. No. Nope. And Way Cool Junior. They had, I would say, four genuine, sort of hits. <laughs> I, I really, honestly, I remember Round and Round, and that's it. Well, they were a little bit before your time too. Round and Round was a pretty good song, though. It was a great song. 
Rat. Is that, should we should just end the show. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let's take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk specifically about some of these sweeteners. Does that sound good? It sounds sweet. I can't believe you don't remember You're in Love. Well, you're not singing it, so how could I possibly remember it? And Lay It Down. Those were two big, big hits. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, like, I was paying a lot of attention to 80s hair metal <laughs> when it was when it was out. I bet and if I it came on, you, you'd probably be like, oh, I know that song. Hmm. Um, all right. Remember, remember Striper, the Christian hair metal band? I saw Striper in concert, my friend. Did you? <laughs> the Fabulous Fox Theater in Atlanta. Did you really? I did. Awesome. Uh, mm, was no, it? it wasn't. <laughs> they had a they had more than one hit, didn't they? Yeah, I was uh I was way into that in my early youth group days. Striper. Well, they, they were rocked. About as tough as you could get. Well, I don't know about that, but they definitely <laughs> rocked for sure. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they definitely wore a lot of spandex. Their drummer played sideways. That was his big trick. Is oh, they oh, set up yeah. the they set it up completely sideways on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> he's not actually playing sideways then. No, no, no. He's playing straight ahead. Right. He just has the drum kit sideways. That was the gimmick, huh? Yeah. That that and religion. Pretty good. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about saccharin. Let's. That was it's actually the Latin word for sugar. Um and that was the one we said earlier, which is the OG uh discovered by two chemist at, uh, named Johns and Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. That's so two guys claimed it. One was definitely in the lab because he was the one who uh, licked his, well, he ate a bread roll, I guess. Oh, really? That, that was sweet. <laughs> and he was like, I don't think this is supposed to be sweet and came to realize it was soaking the coal, in the coal tar <laughs> that was on his fingers. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant it was sitting in a little pool of coal tar, and he like didn't notice it. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. He was warming it up on the Bunsen burner. Uh, so yeah, that an accidental discovery, and it is three hundred times sweeter than sugar. Yeah. And this is one of the ones that is no calorie because it is it is not metabolized by the body at all. No. And it is very famous. Well, I don't know about famous, but the drink tab, the soft drink tab. Mm -hmm. Um, it was very famous for being uh, sweetened in a big way by saccharin. Right, which means that from the, I think, 1977 till 1997, maybe, there was a warning label on TAB that said, quote, use of this product may be hazardous to your health. This product contains saccharin, which has been determined to cause cancer in laboratory animals. Yeah. You remember that warning label on there? Oh, yeah, and... um. You can also still find. I mean, it's not like it went away. It's that is what sweet and low is. Mm -hmm. And you, if you drink Fountain Diet Coke or Pepsi, Fountain mm -hmm. Pepsi, mm -hmm. you're going to have saccharin in there. Yep. And Emily was big on the Fountain Diet Cokes. She was like, "It's just not the same for McCann." And I called her the day. I was like, "It's because of saccharin." She went, "What?" <laughs> She's off no. those now too, though. Yeah, that'll do it. But but what's weird, so I read this really um, great post on Today I Found Out, which is an excellent website, by the way. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, and they, they wrote about the discovery of saccharin and then the controversy, the health controversies of saccharin. And the case they make is that it, 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 it's basically the victim of bad science reporting yeah. and public, public fear, basically. And that if you're a rodent, yes, you should not be drinking tab. Right. Because there, there, there was discovery of bladder cancer and other types of cancer, but specifically bladder cancer in uh, lab rats right. that were being fed saccharin. And um, I guess before they figured out exactly why, the media went and extrapolated it onto people. And so in the public's mind, it became uh, saccharin will give you bladder cancer. And then by the time they went and researched what was going on, there's like the, the specific... I think <clears throat> the specific parts of rat urine um, were combining with the saccharin to form these things called microcrystals. 
in the bladder, yeah. which is tearing up the bladder lining so frequently that as the cells were regenerating, the potential for them to, to uh, grow out of control and become tumors was increased, and so the lab rats were getting um, bladder cancer. The thing is, is the lab rat's urine is not the same as a human's urine. No. Um, and so we just don't get l- bladder cancer to, from tab, apparently, or from saccharin. Well, yeah, and one of the things, I mean, I never really knew this, how they exactly tested. I figured because it was a rat, they would just give them, like, you know, a few drops or something because they're tiny. Mm-hmm. But they apparently dose these lab mice and rats with lots of these additives, uh, large, large doses. And apparently that's to compensate for the fact that they don't use a lot of mice and rats. Yeah. Which I, I'm not... I don't follow the logic there. There isn't any. <laughs> oh, okay. And then they follow it up with, wow, that, that seems to have really gotten on top of you. How about some intravenous cocaine to perk per- you up? <laughs> uh, well, they also said that large doses compensate for possibilities that rodents may be less sensitive to it. Yeah, but I've also read elsewhere that the, the stuff that they're, they're – the tests they're conducting, at least on humans too, are are not – real world tests it's like oh you just drank a, a 12 ounce diet coke and now we're going to base all of our medical recommendations on the the impact it has on your body right they're not taking into account like you said the guy who drinks two two liters or two 12 packs of diet coke a day for 20 30 years right exactly yeah. and the, like this stuff is generally just too new for us to have any like studies on long-term effects of them so yeah. we, we really just don't know yeah I mean, it's I, I don't uh, like I I don't want to foster um, paranoia, like fear, yeah, or yeah. paranoia, or even just yeah, fear, paranoia. But I like the the jury's still out as far as I'm concerned. Agreed. Uh, for its part, though, saccharin was removed from the NIH's list of carcinogens, and uh, they did remove that warning label uh, in the late '90s, like you said. Yeah, and I should say I'm I'm not specifically talking about saccharin. I'm talking about artificial sweeteners in in general. Yeah, totally. The, the jury's still out. Uh, but on to aspartame. That's one of the big targets these days. Um, Equal NutraSweet and NutraTaste uh, are the brand names that it's sold under. And this is a uh, it's a derivative of a couple of amino acids, um, aspartic acid and <laughs> phenylalanine. Lalanine. Phen- yeah, phenylalanine. I think that's right. Yeah, uh, and this has been around since 1965, uh, and this was a chemist named Jim Schlatter, mm-hmm. um, a part of a company that, which is now Pfizer, and he was the one that was licking his finger to pick up paper <laughs> and studying an anti-ulcer drugs. I went, "Hey, that tastes 180 to 200 times sweeter than sugar to me." Right, and so that's what it's used for. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't think they treat ulcers with it anymore. No, but the weird thing about um, aspartame uh, is more in how it's broken down in the body, I think. Um, Yeah, because it is metabolized. Yeah, and this just blew my mind. I had no idea that something like that could break down into methanol in your body. Yeah, wood alcohol. Uh, Weird. I mean, that's one of three things, aspartic acid uh, and then phenylalanine, man. (laughs) And methanol is what it breaks down into. That's just crazy. Right. And so if you um, do not have this disorder called PKU or phenylketonuria, um, it's the wood alcohol you have to pay attention to. But if you have PKU, then you've got a big problem with the phenylalanine because you're you're missing an enzyme that breaks that down. And uh, it can build up in your brain and create brain damage in you. So people who have um, PKU or phenylketonuria um, can't have aspartame at all because of that. But for people who do not have PKU, you still have to worry about the methanol, though. That wood alcohol, if I if I remember correctly, isn't that the stuff that the U.S. government used to poison the illicit um alcohol supply with and a bunch of people went blind and died uh back in don't prohibition remember, but that sounds right i think it was wood alcohol and, and it's just so toxic and normally when we when we consume something that has wood alcohol in it um there it's in the presence of ethanol and that's it's absorbed differently the the ethanol kind of like um 
uh, neutralizes it a little bit. But in aspartame, we're it's breaking down into eth- methanol without the presence of ethanol, and so we're absorbing this toxic component um, just straight up. Yeah, ten percent of aspartame is absorbed as methanol, and the EPA says uh, there's a recommended limit of seven point eight milligrams per day of methanol, and drinking one liter of an aspartame sweetened beverage contains 56 milligrams of methanol. Well, of, well, is, well, is that saying 56 milligrams of absorbed methanol or 56 milligrams of aspartame? I think, I don't know. I think that means methanol. Yeah, that's how I took it. Yeah, so eight, eight times the recommended amount in one liter of an aspartame sweetened beverage. That's not good. Well, and like you were saying, how the ethanol counterbalances it, it's the same as the uh, amino acids. They're naturally part of our diet, mm-hmm. but usually when we consume it, they're, it's counterbalanced by other amino acids. And in the case of uh, aspartame, it doesn't have those, so it's just consuming it on its own. Right. So you're getting it in very high doses, basically. Yeah. And there's been at least one study that has linked um, types, different types of cancers in female rats to uh, aspartame consumption. Right. But again, no official studies show any official problems. Well, none that the FDA is pointing to. Right. They're like, that was Europe. They're overprotective. Yeah, but this is one of the ones, too, that uh, that ARMS uh, program where you can call in and, and report things. Mm-hmm. I think it r- accounts for 75% of all complaints there. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm dizzy. I got headaches. I got seizures. I got fatigue. It's killing me. <laughs> it's killing me, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do something. Uh, what's next? Sucralose? Sucralose, like Splenda. Right. So sucralose is, um, Splenda's marketed, or it was marketed with the kind of slogan, made from sugar so it tastes like sugar, right? And apparently they got sued by the sugar industry. Yeah. Because um, I guess people thought that Splenda was natural. I think there was a... Um, there was some sort of poll that found like 57% of people thought that Splenda was a natural artificial sweetener. And it's not. It's actually, uh, you take a sugar molecule and then you take out three of the hydroxyl groups, hydrogen and oxygen groups, and you replace those with chlorine. This is always a good move. Yeah, that's no longer sugar. (laughs) Nope. That's not sugar anymore. It's not natural either. So what what you have is sucralose, and sucralose is... um, 600 times sweeter than sugar, and it's not metabolized by the body. Right. So it's calorie-free. But there have been studies that have found that it might not be metabolized by the body, but it's absorbed by the body. It's been found in the blood immediately after drinking a can of sucralose-sweetened soda. And it's also been found in breast milk, too, from others who have drank uh, sucralose-sweetened drinks. Yeah, and sucralose is one of those you're going to find because it holds up to heat. So you're going to find it in a lot of baked uh, goods or, uh, you know, like processed baked goods or in um, the, the, I was about to call them kits. What are they called? (laughs) The easy bake oven? No, you know, when you go to make a cake and you get the the stuff. Mix. (laughs) Yeah, the mix, not a kit. (laughs) I like kit though. That's a good one. Yeah, I need a cake kit. (laughs) <laughs> go to the hardware store. <laughs> so, I don't. I don't know what you mean, pal. Look, I'm, it's been a long day. <laughs> Please leave me alone. Uh, but Splenda is one of the biggest, um, probably heaviest used sweetener. Just uh, I was going to call an over the counter sweetener, but when you just use it <laughs> for a sweetener alone to sweeten right. sweeten your tea or your coffee or whatever. Yeah, like you see a lot of Splenda because it has that little green leaf on it. The oh. Is Splenda? I thought Splenda was the yellow one. Oh. Stevie is the one with the green leaf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You're right. Yeah. Stevie actually is natural. It comes from a plant. Oh, okay. <laughs> All, that. All right. I feel much better about the green leaf. Yes. Yeah, sucralose or Splenda is sugar with uh, chlorine. Oh, yeah. Splenda, that yellow packet. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Sweet and low is pink. Yep. Stevie has got the green leaf. I used to dump that sweet and low in my iced tea when I was a kid because I knew no better. Did you really? Wow. Well, because, you know, you th- put sugar in cold iced tea, it does nothing but just go to the bottom. I know. It's absolutely frustrating. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm from Georgia. I need to be drinking sweetened tea, which is while they're brewing it, they dump in a 
full one pound bag of sugar. <laughs> so much. Like they say down here that the um, the straw is supposed to stand straight up in the tea, and that's yeah. how you know when you have enough sugar in your sweet tea. Yeah, I don't drink sweet tea much anymore, but boy, I love it. Yeah, I do. I do too. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, so sucralose, uh, for its worth, isn't as controversial in the public sphere as aspartame is. Um, but, uh, there was a report the FDA in 1998 that said it's approved, but it did cause minor genetic damage in mouse cells, but it was minor and weakly mutagenetic. Yeah. On the, may, uh, may cause, test. may cause light cancer. <laughs> uh, and like you said, they weren't, they sued by the sugar industry. Didn't you say that? Yeah. I don't know what the outcome was. I, I don't know. I haven't heard that slogan in a while, so I'll bet the sugar industry won. Yeah, they, now it's just Splenda. You know the deal. Yeah, you know we used to say, <laughs> just think, just think, think hard. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> uh, and then finally, we have sugar alcohols, which I wasn't super familiar with, actually. I am because I, uh, up until this week, chewed a lot of sugar-free gum. Oh. And um, yeah. a lot of it is is uh, sweetened with sugar alcohols, which is, it's... Um, it's where you take a sugar and you add a hydrogen atom to it, right? Gotcha. So there's stuff like um, sorbitol, xylitol, um, uh, ethyritol. <laughs> yeah. I even practiced that one. Theritol? Had, yes, thank you. Had a little trouble with it. But um, they don't have calories because they're not typically absorbed by the body. Although some... Some actually do have just about as many calories as sugar. Yeah. So you do have to kind of watch it. Um, but f- sugar alcohols typically are used less for weight loss and more for um, like uh, sugar or blood sugar control, like among people with diabetes. Oh, uh, okay. Because so it might have the calories, but it doesn't. It doesn't have the glycemic load that that sugar does. Um, and even some artificial sweeteners do, but they taste really, really good. They're they're about as close to sugar as you can possibly get, um, and still have fewer calories or whatever. The problem with them is that they can, um, they're like uh, butterfish, escarole. Yeah. They they cause the anal leakage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They I'm gonna bring that burns. up every chance I get. You know. Uh, I think we have our first great band name of 2017, too. Not anal leakage, but glycemic load. <laughs> anal yeah. leakage, no one wants to hear that. No. It's like Diarrhea Planet. Oh, yeah. Didn't they tweet back poop, at us? Poop knife? <laughs> Is that what it was? You were telling Diarrhea Planet to, to change, change the name, name to Poop Knife? And they, yeah, they tweeted, never. <laughs> <laughs> never. Who are you? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that laxative effect, um, if you have a daily dose of 50 grams or 20 grams, uh, of 50 grams of the sorbitol or 20 grams of the mannitol, mm-hmm. it has to be labeled that it has a laxative effect. Yeah, but the Center for Science and the Public Interest says, no, 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 only 10 grams of sorbitol can make you poop your pants. So maybe you guys <laughs> should lower it for that warning. And the FDA said, look, man, we're, we're taking a nap. Yeah, no way. they're like, what? can we just have people on the verge of pooping their pants, but not quite? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I saw an alternative to all this, you know. Oh, what, real sugar? That is one alternative. And the thing is, is uh, yeah, the, the, the upshot of all this is, well, maybe sugar is not so bad. Refined sugar is pretty bad for you. Yeah. And so is like high fructose corn syrup. But there are plenty of like natural forms of sugar, too, like unrefined raw demerara sugar or honey. There's a lot of places you can get sweetness right, yeah. that aren't necessarily Agave. bad for you. Sure, yeah. right? Um, but then if you're super hip with the science too, you might be in favor of what are called sweet tasting proteins. And these are actually pretty cutting edge from what I've seen. There's seven that have been identified so far. All of them come from plants that grow in the rainforest. Hmm. And um, they are proteins. They're not carbohydrates. They're actual proteins. Like sweet so they, chicken? They, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Paraguayan sweet chicken. <laughs> Paraguayan sweet bird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, uh, they, they, so they're not going to, they're not going to raise your glycemic index. 
like your blood sugar. They're not going to lead to weight gain. Um, they're, they're just proteins. And apparently some of them are quite sweet. And they're looking into using those they're looking as an into- alternative to <laughs> the artificial sweeteners, which are the alternative to sugar. So they can decimate the rainforest in yet another way. Well, hopefully this will help them protect the rainforest. They'll be oh. like, no, 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 this is where our sweet comes from. Gotcha. Stop cutting it down. Okay. Keep keep your fingers crossed. They're crossed. Okay, that's all I got. That's all I got. So that's uh, artificial sweeteners, everybody. Uh, if you want to know more about those, you can type those words in the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and um, the Noid will appear. <laughs> and since I said Noid, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this Warmed My Heart Over the Holidays. <laughs> Scotch. Hi, yeah, that too. Hi, Josh and Chuck. Uh, I'm Grace, and I'm 17 years old. I'm the oldest of three sisters, Lily, 15, Rose, 10. Great names. Yep. Uh, we started listening to your podcast in 2009 uh, when our parents split up, and we moved a state away from our dad. Uh, as a tradition now, we always listen to a podcast of yours to this very day when we are traveling between the two states with our dad. Nice. Uh, it's been such a fun way to pass the time during road trips. Your podcasts have uh, been the source of so many interesting conversations and such a wonderful way to bring our family together over the years. For instance, all three of us girls vividly remember the Vulture episode for no apparent reason (laughs) and found the Haunted House episode oddly cool. Uh, Lily, who was the 15-year-old, she -hmm. enjoys the Halloween story episodes. Rose, 10, thinks it's funny when you guys get off track. (laughs) God bless you, Rose. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I really like to annoy my friends with all the useless facts that I now know. Uh, We are such hardcore fans that we even had marathons of your TV series. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, And we have literally been a fan of you guys since you started. Thanks for being a part of our childhood. Love, the Harvey family. That's fantastic. That was a fantastic email. It was great. And they sent a picture of Dad behind the wheel <clears throat> uh, driving with uh, it looked like Grace up front and Lily and Rose in the back, mm-hmm. and they were all just smiling and just, just they just had this lovely aura about them. Thanks to us. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Thanks to the Vulture episode. Anyway, I love the Harvey family now. They're they're tops on my list. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Harvey family, for writing in. We appreciate that big time. And to old man Harvey, you're doing yeah. the right thing, sir. Yep. Keep both hands on the wheel. <laughs> That's right. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us like the Harveys did to let us know how much of a role we've played in your life, we love hearing that kind of stuff. You can tweet to us. Uh, I'm at Josh Um Clark, and we're also at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can hang out with Chuck on Facebook at Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Uh, you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 